Thanks for coming for a book launch. The book titled The Impossible State, written by Dr. Victor Cha. Uh, my name is Choi Gang, Vice President of Asan Institute. It is my great pleasure and honor to moderate this book launch event, because actually it's, it's really a pleasure to have Victor. Always is my uh, experience actually over the past almost 20 years working with him in private capacity. So, of course, Victor Cha doesn't need any kind of introduction, but actually as a formal procedure, let me read some of his career. Senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, DS Song Korea Foundation Chair in uh, Asian Studies and Director. Director of the Asian Studies Program at Georgetown University and former Director for Asian Affairs in National Security Council during the Bush administration. Of course, his top uh, pro, uh, advisor to George Bush on North Korean affairs. So everybody knows his reputation, his integrity as a scholar, as, as a practitioner. So it is my great pleasure to have you here today, Victor. So uh, before I uh, ask Victor to make some interactive remarks, let me read some reviews. Of this is the, this first it was published in 2012, about four years ago by Random House. And Washington Post says, an up-close, insightful portrait, the impossible state is a clear-headed, bold examination of North Korea and its future. Foreign Affairs says, a meaty, fast-paced portrait of North Korean society, economy, politics, and foreign policy by an expert who has studied the regime as a scholar and interacted with its officials. Actually, from our perspective, it's selling well. Number one selling book. Yeah, over the past several months, actually more than 500 copies are sold. Uh, still, it's number one selling book in our uh, section. So it's a great pleasure and honor to have. And also, actually, Asan has been very pleased to translate your book into Korean. And I hope so, maybe, if you finish the second volume, the updated volume of this one, it would be much more appreciated. Of course, it's my... A uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Victor and uh, today, and also I'd like to hand it over to Mike to Victor. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, the uh, um, well, first of all, it's it's a pleasure to share this stage with Dr. Chegong, who is an old old friend um, and uh, um, and a close colleague, scholar. Uh, policy expert. Um, he's very well respected, uh, not just here in Seoul, but also in Washington, D.C., and uh, all over the world. So it's really a pleasure to share the stage with you. Um, I'm especially grateful to the Asan Institute for publishing, for translating the book. This is actually the first time I've seen the book. So is that going to ruin the, I don't want to ruin the, uh, the shot. for, <laughs> But um, it's the first time I've seen the book, and I want to uh, thank the Asan Institute for, uh, for translating it. As many of you who've written books uh, know, the, the process of getting a book translated into another uh, language is, in some ways, it's fairly random. Um, and it really depends on whether there are, are parties who are interested, who can find uh, the people to do the translation. Um, uh, and then the other thing is that The Impossible States, as you can see, it's a big book. It's quite big. And as many of you who live in Korea know, these kind of books, they usually don't publish these. It's certainly in one volume. This is usually like two or three volumes. So I was very happy to, happy to see them do that. Um, so uh, let me just tell you a little bit of the background on the book, um, and then we can certainly have a uh, more substantive discussion. So when I left the... Um, the U.S. government in 2007 and went back to Georgetown, actually the absolute last thing that I wanted to do was to write a book about North Korea. Um, I was actually sick of North Korea. And, um, and so I, I ended up writing a book about sports and politics um, in Asia because it was the year before the Beijing Olympics and uh, to me, that was actually a very, it was a cathartic, it was a cleansing experience. It felt very nice to do that. Um, but then um, an editor 
by the name of Dan Halpern approached me uh, a few years later and asked if I'd be interested in doing this. And, and I said, why me? And he said, you know, you've worked on the policy, you've studied as a scholar, as a scholar you have a perspective on it that most people don't have. And, and so he convinced me to, to, to do that. Um, the, um, the, as we, as when I wrote the book, it was, um, I remember we were looking for, from, um, we were looking for basically a publication date sometime, I don't know, it was towards the, I think we were actually looking at 2013 for the publication date. Um, and then, um, um, something happened along the way. Uh, the North Korean leader died. <laughs> and um, and I, the the American version of the book was published by a, a trade press called Echo, and they don't operate like university presses where they say you know, it'll come out five years from now. When Kim Jong Il died, the editor called me and said, um, "We want to get this book out in four months," and so um, uh, we wrote really quickly to get the book out. Uh, and uh, and it's been um, and it's been quite successful uh, in uh, in the U.S. The, let, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about the book. Um, the uh, the first is that I think um, it, we're right now in a situation where both the U.S. and DPRK are caught in spirals. Um, the North Koreans are caught in um, what I call the legitimacy spiral, which is that you have a new young leadership that has, that tried to seek or gain legitimacy through trumpeting economic development and a modern way of life and all these other sorts of things for a new generation in North Korea. And uh, that has failed. And because of that, um, he has had to revert to nuclear weapons as the primary mantle of legitimacy. And of course, the more he relies on his nuclear weapons as the mantle of legitimacy, the more the sanctions increase, which makes it harder for him to pursue economic development as a source of legitimacy. So that's a, that's a negative spiral. And on the US side, I think we've kind of fallen into a negotiation spiral, which is that we, um, in the past, we were very concerned about not overreacting to every North Korean provocation uh, because we didn't want to be led around by the nose every time the North did some sort of uh, missile test or nuclear test. Um, and we've now fallen into a spiral where we consciously try to underreact even as, so we were overreacting when the capabilities were probably not as formidable. And now we have a tendency to underreact when the capabilities are, you know, are moving at a pace that we haven't seen in the past. And of course, then this is all exacerbated by the election spiral. You know, the election spiral here in the ROK, uh, your presidential elections in, in, uh, in, over a, in a little over a year, and of course our presidential elections uh, later this year. So. Um, I think that all contributes to the current stasis that we're now in. Um, I'll, you know, I, I'll give you the, probably not a good idea, but I'll give you the punchline of the book, uh, but that doesn't preclude you from still buying it. Um, and the, basically the punchline of the book is that uh, I see a situation where the politics of the regime under this new leadership has become more and more uh, conservative, more and more hardline, at a time when society in North Korea, for the first time, is changing. Uh, with the introduction of private economy, markets, uh, information from the outside, um, you have forces in the state and society that are pulling in different directions. Um, uh, the politics pulling in one direction and society pulling in another. And um, in most cases, that's not a good situation. Sooner or later, that's going, that stress is going to break. We just don't know what the trigger is. I mean, I can, I can surmise what I think the trigger might be, 
or what the triggers might be, but that is not a situation that's stable. And I say in the book, you know, look, I have lots of friends who are Sovietologists that predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union after it happened. Um, and I have lots of friends that are Middle East experts that predicted the Arab Spring after it happened. And um, um, I don't want to be one to predict something after it happens. I mean, I think, I, I'm not saying that it's going to happen anytime soon, but the elements are there. And, and I think we have, to, we have to acknowledge that. Thank you, Victor. Actually, the, 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 the size of the actual thickness of the book actually scared me when I first started. It's about 600 pages. But when I first, first opened up, it's like a novel. It's really storytelling. It covers the politics, society, economy. So every dimension, every issue you can imagine in North Korea. So I strongly urge you to buy this book. You can buy this book at discount price during uh, this awesome plenum. So actually, you can pay about $14 per copy for that. But actually, it's really uh, eye-opening book. If you don't know much about North Korea, or if you want to review the policies of that country over the uh, several decades, I, I strongly urge you to, to read it. And also, there's a, he actually, Victor, has reflected his personal experience in dealing with North Korea very much. I, I enjoy this book very. And I wonder, why did you use the word impossible state? That's the first question. Yeah, so um, that was actually not my I don't think I didn't even have a title for the book, and the editor came up with that, and and uh, and I liked it. I mean, I think the the basic idea was this notion that I mean, this is really an impossible state in many ways. It's impossible in the sense that it's impossible to really understand it. It's impossible in the sense that um, it's a state that you know in the 21st century really should not be in existence the way it is. Um, um, and it's impossible in the sense that it's really been very difficult for any country to penetrate it in terms of uh, having a, a genuine relationship with it. So for all these reasons, um, it, was, uh, it was impossible. I think the other thing was at, at one point, it, it, it was the impossible state, North Korea, past, present, and future, and we took out the present. We, I don't know why, but we took out the present, so it's past. And, uh, and future. Um, and, you know, when I wrote it, I, you know, I, I had, I did not know how it would be received. And, um, and uh, I was quite surprised that it was received very positively. Um, got a lot of very good reviews. Um, you mentioned some of them. And, uh, and people have picked up on individual chapters. So I know, for example, that the chapter on human rights um, was actually quite important to Justice Kirby, Michael Kirby. Uh, as he was preparing to do the Commission of Inquiry report. So it's, it's you know, as a, as a scholar, it's good to know that people are reading it and they find it useful. So. And of course, uh, you illustrated five mistakes made by North Korean regimes over the past several decades. So what is the source of that kinds of mistakes? Um, so I think in the, yeah, in the book, I, the, in one of the chapters I sort of say, here are the five major mistakes that the regime has made. Uh, really going back to the start of the nation state in the first five-year economic plan to other, other mistakes they've made along the way. Um, um, and in the end, I mean, if you had to choose one thing that explains the mistakes, it, you would have to choose ideology. I mean, that... Many of these were uh, choices that were made uh, that reflected ideology and the perpetuation of the cult of personality leadership. Uh, they, and, and by any other standard, they would not be rational, economic, or political decisions. And so if, you had to pick, if I had to pick one thing, that would be the source of it. When I, in the economics chapter, I point to these bad economic decisions that they made, and if you look at every single one of them, it had to do with ideology um, and, uh, and nothing else. And so that, that was the source of it all. So your conclusion is much like the Jonathan Pollack's the, the argument in his book about the no exit. So like a political system and ideology itself actually prevents North Korea to make some kinds of reform and also keep actually make them to make the, the continuously the mistakes is inevitable for them. So, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's um, there's a uh, one passage in the book where I talk about uh, um, coming back. I, I coming back from North Korea during a trip I had to make and um, coming back, being driven back by the foreign ministry to the DMZ and then coming through the joint security, walking across the, J, uh, the, the demarcation line onto the US, I mean onto the South Korean side and then taking a helicopter from there into Seoul to, to, um, to report to the Blue House about the trip and um, taking that helicopter ride in, the first thing you see as you, as you start heading in towards Seoul is this massive white factory complex. And I asked the, my control officer, I said, what is that? And, they, and, and, and she said, that's the, the uh, production complex for Samsung. And then as you get closer to the city, you start seeing all the buildings. And, and I remember it was, it was at that point that I thought to myself, that um, this is what politics does. I mean, I just come from one part of Korea, which is just, you know, in a terrible state. Uh, and then you come to the other side of Korea and you see all this, and the only thing that explains it is politics. Right? It's, not, it's not like there's a difference in the two people, right? Genetically, they're the same people, and this is what politics has done to one side of the peninsula versus the other. Right? Yeah, because actually, I'm sure there's people in this, this room are much more interested in your prediction about the future. So actually, it seems to me the situation has worsened over the past three years. So make sure your argument holds very well, but the future looks ugly and uglier and much more unstable inside North Korea under the Kim Jong-un leadership. So maybe somebody says that, oh, Kim Jong-un, you know, compared to Kim Jong-un, is much more rational. I don't know whether he's rational or not. Anyhow, much more that he knew how to live with China, but Kim Jong is totally different from his father. So do you think the, 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 the situation inside North Korea is going to be more unstable? Of course, you have alluded to that fact already, but this trajectory keep going into the future? Do you think so? Yeah, I'm concerned about the direction in which it's going. Uh, you know, I think there have been fluctuations in how we think about this new leadership. Initially, there was even some optimism uh, when he came in because he was young and he was educated outside of North Korea. There were all these theories of a potentially enlightened leader coming in, and I don't think anybody feels that way today. Um, and that he seems to be pushing past boundaries that we all thought uh, might have been there you know, with, with his father. Uh, he seems to be pushing past all those and, uh, and headed in a direction. We just don't know which, what direction that, he, that he's headed in right now. So I would say the situation certainly has, has gotten a lot worse um, than when I wrote the book. Um, but I did feel that when I was writing this book, and I say it in the book so, you know, and people can, peop I'm sure that people will and have, will say or have already said that, you know, Cha got it wrong already, but I, I said that I thought, I just felt like something big was going to happen uh, in North Korea um, within the next several years. And I think I actually say that in the book somewhere, um, and, uh, um, and I still feel that way. I still feel like there's something that's going to happen. I think, I, I should say that, um, you know, when we talk like this, we're talking about sort of reflections and feelings and hunches. But one of the things that I try to do in this book is, you know, so North Korea is the, the blackest of black boxes. And so we, I actually try to bring some data to our discussion of North Korea, uh, um, uh, uh, some hard data in our discussion of North Korea. And it was actually after writing this book that um, from my position at CSIS, what we've been doing a lot of, spending a lot of time doing is actually collecting a lot of data uh, hard data on uh, North Korean provocations, on their negotiation style, on, um, on exercising and these sorts of things because we don't have any data on, on North Korea. And so that was one of the things I think that this book, writing this book helped me do in terms of my own research on North Korea. Okay, and also I have to emphasize that actually in his, in his book, uh, chapter nine, he started with this 
uh, Honorary Chairman Chung Ju Young's efforts to make a contribution to the unification by taking 1001 it's a cows to North Korea, and also he mentioned about, but at, at, at the end of his chapter, you mentioned about the, the role of the United States and role of Japan in achieving the unification. So can you be more specific, especially from your own perspective, the Japan's role in achieving the unification? That's a really hard question, because I can't remember what I wrote. <laughs> this, this was a while ago, so. Uh, yeah, the, um, so, um, I know that it's hard for Koreans to think about uh, Japanese role when we talk about unification, but um, um, but if we look at things historically, um, Japan has played an important role in Korea's development. I mean, they played a very important role in Korea's development in the 60s and the 70s. Um, <clears throat> they were the number one provider of food assistance to North Korea before uh, Koizumi's visit to to Pyongyang and wh whenever that was, 2000, 2001. Um, and uh, while I don't expect Japan to be physically on the Korean Peninsula during unification, uh, their, ex their past experience with the peninsula, um, uh, their, uh, their technical expertise, their financial support, I think will play some role uh, in, in, in unification. And, and my own view is, looking at this over the years, I feel like Korean thinking on unification has evolved too. Um, in the past, whenever you brought up the, uh, the topic of unification in a group like this, um, the Korean reaction would be very, would become very insular. They would not want to talk about it. This is ours, it's nobody else's. Nobody else should be talking about it. And I feel like that's really changed over time into understanding that the stakes in unification are just so big, not just for the Korean nation, but for everybody around Korea. And so there's been a much more open uh, willingness to, to think about what roles others can play. So actually, uh, another important player in achieving the unification would be China. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of role China should play in achieving the unification from your perspective? Um, <coughs> so I, I think, I mean, when, if we're talking about the transition period, I think they play a, they clearly play a very critical role. And uh, um, um, whether that's in terms of their border or in terms of um, nuclear weapons or any of these other things. But in the, in the longer term, um, to me, I, I have a pretty good sense of what a United Korea-US relationship is gonna look like. And I have a pretty good sense of what I think a United Korea-Japan relationship would look like. I don't have a very good sense of what a United Korea-China relationship could look like. On the one hand, it could be, you know, it could be one that's very positive based on economic cooperation, uh, but it could also be a relationship that might be very difficult when a United, a United Korea that presumably is an advanced industrialized democracy now shares a contiguous land border with the biggest communist country in the world. You know, that, you can imagine insecurity arising from that. So to me, that relationship is the most difficult to think about uh, when we think about a United Korea. Thank you, Victor. Now I'd like to open the floor to get the questions from the audience. So please uh, identify yourself. I think we will bring the mic to you, okay? It's not working. Another mic. <laughs> it's coming. So it's not coming yet, so in the meantime, I have to entertain you with another question. <laughs> so <laughs> actually, so what about your thinking of this, the, the nuclear issue? Still, we have not made any progress at all, so you have mentioned about CVID, so how we can deal with nuclear issue yeah. in the yeah. coming days and years? Yeah. So um, just, uh, um, 
So one of the things that I tried to do in this book was actually to um, um, sort of collect data over all past U.S. administrations about their policies towards North Korea to try to uh, uh, to try to demonstrate that there is, contrary to, to popular media characterizations, there is actually remarkable consistency in U.S. nuclear policy with North Korea over the past 25 years, you know, going back to uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, that there has been a remarkable consistency in what the United States has sought to do and what it has been willing to give. Um, and, uh, and I thought that was an important point to make because both in the press here as well as in the United States, there are these caricatures that have been drawn of you know, the Clinton administration's policies and the Bush administration's policies and the Obama administration's policies. And the point of trying to show the consistency was to say every time things go bad with North Korea, we like to blame U.S. policy or South Korea policy, but it's really North Korean policy that's the problem. And, and nowhere has that become more apparent than in the fact that you have, you know, you, you have had a so-called hardline or hawkish Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, which was blamed for North Korea's first nuclear test. I mean, I think, honestly, I think scholars and experts, they actually blame the United States for North Korea's first nuclear test. Um, and yet, it's, it's highly likely that under President Obama's administration, uh, which is not seen as hawkish, we may see four nuclear tests. Um, so my point is that there is a remarkable consistency in U.S. policy in that the source of the failure really isn't, you can, you can blame the policy, but then you have to blame everybody's policy. The source of the failure is really that North Korea doesn't want to give up its nuclear weapon. Thank you. No. Easily? All right. Thank you very much. Leif Eric Easley, Ihua Women's University and the Asan Institute. Congratulations on the translation. Wanted to ask you, Professor Cha, about the reception of the book, obviously, in, in English and, and to the extent that it's been circulated in China, as I know it has. The reception of the book by Chinese colleagues and the sort of discussion that you've had with Chinese colleagues about uh, your analysis in the book and how your analysis uh, informs our understanding of changing uh, DPRK-China relations. Um, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I, to be honest, Leif, I haven't had much Chinese reaction to the, to the book. I'm open to it being translated into Chinese, of course. But I haven't had much Chinese reaction. But let me say um, that one of the things that we did do in this book is um, um, we, uh, again, collected data on all the visits that Kim Jong-il made to China from 2000 to 2010, I think it was. And, because uh, as you know, uh, you know, after South Korea and China normalized relations in 1992, there were no leadership visits by the North Korean leadership to China, really for almost a whole decade until Kim Jong-il finally went. And then we wanted to just collect data on sort of all the places, all the visits, and in particular, all the places that the Chinese leadership took him. And it became very clear when we looked at all the places that they took him for each visit, it's very clear what the Chinese strategy was. I mean, it was, they took him to a cell phone factory, to a car plant, to a fiber optics plant. It was just so consistent over the years that they were trying to push top-down reform. And, um, and as far as we knew, at least as far as I knew, nobody had n collected that. Uh, and, um, at one point, even the U.S. government called and they asked to see the chart because they had not seen a chart like that before. Um, and I only showed it to them on the condition that they would not classify it. So, so, um, uh, so I think um, the, uh, the, the, there's some interesting data that can be mined in terms of this relationship, and that was just a, fall, first, a small first step at doing that. Okay. Okay, there. Gentlemen. Hi, uh, my name is Alon Lefkowitz from uh, Barilan University. Uh, a scenario, Kim Jong-un calls President Obama and asks him to, to meet. Obama calls you and asks you, what do you think we can do with the nuclear issue? Do you think they will freeze? 
Do you think they give up? Or do you think they're just going to have lunch and that's it? So what do you recommend that is feasible on a nuclear issue with North Korea? Um, well, I don't know if I'd recommend him to accept the invitation for lunch, uh, first of all. Um, you know, we don't know, right? I mean, the... I don't know the, I can't give you a definitive answer to your question. I can only give you what I think, um, what I think is the situation with regard to the nuclear weapons, and that is that I think North Korea has really turned a corner within the last six months in the sense that um, they're not interested in denuclearization anymore. Um, they're not interested in six party talks. They're not interested in leap day deals. They're not interested in any of that anymore. And that there is a confidence that they seem to evince now with regard to their nuclear status that I have not seen before. And so if the North Korean leader were to say to the US president, let's have lunch, and the president were to ask me, do you think I can get pry these nuclear weapons out of his hands if I meet him face to face? My honest answer today would, would be no, I don't think you can, because um, that may have been the case years ago, but uh, as far as, as they've come, they've made pretty clear now that they're not willing to, to give them up. Um, that's not to say it's impossible in the future, but their position has changed very clearly in a way that um, was not as clear, for example, when we were doing the six-party negotiations. Okay, that question will be discussed in the final plenary session because we are going to deal with North Korean issue in the final plenary. So save the best for the last, please. Okay, and other questions? Hi, my name is Sahai Only, the former Internet Korea Chair at CSI. It's, it's very nice to see you again, Dr. Cha. Um, several years ago in your book with David Kong, you argued that the North Korean's perception of the American threat is, has no grounds, and then it is the nuclear program of North Korea is just the kind of like a bargain for negotiating with uh, un the United States. but uh, recent days, the U.S. ROK military exercise uh, presumes the preemptive attack uh, against the North Korea if they have uh, signs to launch nuclear missiles or other uh, first attack. So do you still think that North Korea's perception of a United States threat is uh, unreliable or do you have any other opinion? So, um and again, I'm conscious that, that I know you're having a discussion on this in the, in the next panel, but the, um, um, there are a couple of things that worry me about the current situation, right? The first is that I think it's just going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, uh, so we have the, uh, the Party Congress coming up next week, and then in August we have more exercising. And then in November, we have the U.S. elections, right? Now, uh, again, what we've been doing at CSIS is collecting data, right? You were probably doing part of that, collecting data. And so what we know is that um, in terms of exercising, um, if the state of U.S. DPRK relations are uh, bad before the exercises, you can bet the North Koreans are going to respond during the exercising. Um, as opposed to if the relationship between the U.S. and DPRK is you know, not in as bad a state as it is right now. Um, the second thing is that, uh, again, looking at the data, we know that the North Koreans like to do things during U.S. elections, right? Presidential elections, congressional elections, also national assembly elections, they like to do uh, provocations. So I, you know, things are gonna get worse through the end of this year. That's the first thing that worries me. The second is that um, as we get to the party congress next week, it's to me again highly likely that they're going to do another nuclear test and perhaps another mis missile test because they want to really establish 
to their own people and to the world that they are a nuclear weapon state. Um, and so I'm worried about more provocations in the, in the coming week. And then finally, the thing that worries me the most about all this is that the, your, the last point you referred to, which is um, uh, as North Korea acquires all of these nuclear weapons, do they understand that the primary lesson of nuclear deterrence is that you acquire nuclear weapons not to use them? Right? You acquire nuclear weapons to deter, to deter use by the other side. You don't acquire them to use them. And at least in all the theatrical performances that Kim Jong-un does related to nuclear weapons, one does not get a sense that he has a sophisticated understanding of nuclear deterrence and the non-use of nuclear weapons. Um, uh, and that worries me, that worries me a great deal. Okay. Well, we have time for a couple of questions, so is there any question? Okay. And, one, and the lady. Lady first. Hi, uh, my name is Insan Kang, and I'm at the Chosun Ilbo. And congratulations for your new book. And uh, I have a question. I, I mean, the, it's reported that North Korea is you know, preparing for their fifth nuclear test. And we have seen lots of things so far. So as you just mentioned that North Korea is, I mean, Kim Jong-un is not interested in denuclearization anymore. And then should we change the whole set of policies so far? We, I mean, US and South Korea has done so far. Okay, uh, uh, let me have a, uh, the final question and then respond. Okay. Right. okay, well, I saw a couple of hands over there. So, okay, please. Um, I'm Koichi Onemura from Mainichi newspaper. And as you mentioned here and in the book, there is a growing gap between rigid ideology and uh, changing society. So isn't there a slight chance, possibility, for Kim Jong-un to follow the direction of changing society? Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, both great questions. On uh, Kang in sans question, I think, um, yeah, we're probably due for some sort of rethink or, you know, it sounds, it sounds overused, but a new paradigm in how we think about this problem. But, however, I think that that new paradigm is something that will have to be thought of in a regional context. So in other words, I think if we're going to get to a new paradigm about how to think strategically about this problem, it's going to have to involve the United States, the ROK, and China. Um, it, it's, it's, it's hard to think about new permutations of policy that don't involve those three countries. And, and I think it's encouraging that as the situation has got, I mean, it's not, it doesn't sound right. It, it's encouraging as the situation has gotten worse that China seems to be more open to track 1.5 and track one trilateral discussions now. Um, and that, that's, I think, an important, important step forward. Um, on, the, on the question of uh, the growing gap between North Korean society and the politics and whether Kim Jong, the leadership can shift, can change, can move in that direction. Um, <clears throat> I don't deny that they could think about doing that, but they face the classic, right? They cl face the classic dictator's dilemma, which is as soon as they start trying to do that, as soon as they start, start trying to open, right? They need to open to survive but the process of opening can lead to their demise, right? This is the classic dictator's dilemma. And that's, you know, I think that's the case for North Korea in spades. I mean, they, the, as soon as they start to allow uh, more openness, more information into the country, you know, um, the, the dominance of the private economy over, over the public economy, the more they do that, uh, they, the more it's going to be harder for them to have control. Um, and, and there, the, 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 the issue is that control is the most important thing in North Korea. It's more important than anything else. You know, they're willing to let the country starve for control. And as long as that's the case, 
they're not going to move in the direction of reform. Actually, exactly says the impossible state. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Actually, we have reached the final moment of uh, this uh, book launch. Um, I hope to see the follow-up version of this one, updated version, so including the Kim Jong-un era and also your personal experience and observation in the coming years. I really appreciate uh, coming to Seoul, despite all your tight schedule. You have never canceled your class, and yeah. then that's why you're here. And uh, But I really appreciate your man of integrity, and also I hope uh, this is going to be sell well into the future. So we are very much appreciate uh, your cooperation and also the dedication on this field very much. And and we have uh, prepared some, some token of appreciation. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you for joining us this uh, lunch break. Uh, we will resume our session at 1.30. 1.30. Thank you.